what happens in your brain when you read code? And what do we already know from what happens in your brain when you read text that we can use? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. People know this and we can just use what natural language already knows. So what, what do we know about code reading or about reading language? When information enters your brain, it first enters the short-term memory that I guess you have heard of. So firstly, information is stored in your short-term memory for a brief period of time. You can think a bit of this as your brain's RAM. Information can be stored there briefly and it's a lot smaller than long-term storage. And this has been known for a pretty long time already. So George Miller in the 1950s already said that your short-term memory is really small. It can only hold between five and nine elements. So it's really, really tiny. Let's actually try that in practice. So I hope you are participating, looking at the chat as well in the meantime. I hope you are participating. I will show you a brief sentence, just a sentence of three words. And it is your job at home to remember and reproduce the sentence but I will show it to you for a very brief time. It's like half a second. It will be like, and it's gone. Just to show you how bad, how small your short term memory is. So I hope you're watching at home. There we go, prepare. So I guess you're screaming at your phone. I'm like, this is unreasonably hard, Hermans. This is undoable, we, we cannot do it. Well, I'm sorry. That's just how small your short-term memory is. It can only hold between five and nine elements. Actually, newer research even suggests it might be smaller. It might be between two and six elements. In any case, it is really, really small. So now you might wonder, well, if our short-term memory is so small, how do we do anything? Like, how is it possible that I can speak in a language that isn't even my first language and also wave my hands and also occasionally look at the chat messages? How is that even possible with such a tiny brain? Well, your short-term memory doesn't work alone. It actually collaborates in your brain with your working memory. So if you have read a sentence, then from the short-term memory, it is sent on, processed through the working memory. But in the working memory, not just information from your short-term memory is stored, but also information from your long-term memory. Your long-term memory really helps your working memory process. And of that, we will also see a small example. So I'll show you yet another sentence and there you can see that your short-term memory can be supported by your long-term memory. Here we go. I hope you're ready for yet another sentence. So that felt doable, I guess, right? It was still hard. I know it was still quite hard, but at least now you could make sense of what was there. Probably you, you could understand a few letters. Not because it was substantially, like inherently easier, but those letters are things you've practiced. So often you've looked at letters that you can very quickly recognize and remember them. And I will show you even how your long-term memory can support your short-term memory so that you can remember a sentence, something that seemed undoable just a few minutes ago suddenly turns out to be relatively easy if your long-term memory helps you. So I'll show you a third sentence and I am sure everyone can do it. If you just like don't blink and don't miss the sentence, you can remember this like 100%. Here we go. So that was easy, right? Even though it was the exact same length of the first sentence and the second sentence. But what happens here is you can quickly understand this. Remember this, why? Because you're not remembering 
half a circle and a circle with a comma attached to it and a Catholic cross and a long stripe and a tiny circle. If you're not remembering like that, you can immediately recognize the letters because you've seen them so often. And then not only are you recognizing the letters, you are recognizing words. You are saying, not in your memory, C-A-T. L-O-V-E. No, it's like cat. It's one thing. So those things are retrieved from your long-term memory. You know the letters. You know what a cake is and what loves is. So the number of things you have to remember now has suddenly decreased from all the individual letters, which are way too many, to three things, which easily fit your short-term memory. So here you see in action the collaboration between long and short term memory. So now let's let's circle back to programming because it sort of turned into an introductory cognitive science lecture, which is also interesting, I guess. But I know most of you came here to listen to know about getting better at reading code. What happens in your brain when you read code? So let's look at three different programs. Because with the different forms of memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, and working memory, come different processes related to code, different reasons why code can be confusing. So let's look at this program. It's a program in a programming language called APL, which is sort of a weird and esoteric programming language that most, most professional programmers don't know. It's very old. It's from like 1960, and it's mainly meant to do vector calculations. So I'm just going to assume that this program to you is confusing because the program is 22222TN. Like this is the program. This is an entire program in APL. So why are you confused by this? It's, it's because of the T. You don't know what T does. You probably know what two, 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 two. You know that it's twos. And I will tell you that the N is the input parameter to this program. So you know what that is. It, it will be a number as well. But then what is that T thing? So this is an issue with your long-term memory, right? You just don't know what the T is. It's not because you're not capable of processing this program. You just don't know what the thing is. No one ever told you what it is. So you have a long-term memory issue. This program, a Java program, also might be confusing to you. Especially if you're not a trained Java programmer. If you're like me, mainly using Python as a programming language, then this might be confusing because it overloads your short-term memory. If you really want to understand it, you, you have to remember many things. Public clause, binary calculator, public static void, main, int, end, system out, print line, integer binary string. If you're an experienced Java programmer, you probably know that public clause and public static void main is all not so important. Probably where the importance are is in the binary string and the binary calculation. But you can only see that if you're not all too confused by all the fluff that is there. So this program is a bit fluffy. And if you're not used to it, this will be heavy on your short term memory. Here is a third program. By the way, they all do the same. All these programs calculate the binary representation of the number n. Here's a program that's also confusing, probably, but it's confusing for yet another reason. Here, the program is confusing because you have to do so many things. It is your working memory in this program that is being stressed, is being, being stretched to its limits, because what is going on here? You can't really see. Probably if you would actually have to debug this program, you, you would take a pen, you'd say, okay, well, let's just try this for the value n. Okay, so n is seven, what happens? Okay, so b is the empty string, and then this loop goes from seven to zero. Okay, so then n is, okay, that's seven divided by two, so that's three because it's rounded. 
Okay, uh, so then B string is, okay, so it's a string zero. Okay, and what happens in the next iteration? So you just have to work really hard to understand this. If you're somewhat familiar with, with programming languages, even if you're not familiar with basic, you will know what most of this does. You know let, you know the equal sign assignment, you know the empty string, you know a for loop. Your, your long-term memory is fine, right? The issue here is your working memory. You have to do so many things. So you might be like, yes, but what you've just showed us just means that reading code is really hard. Look, you showed us all these types of confusion. Confusion, And that might lead to what I sometimes think is, is so sad that people, they look at a certain library, like I sometimes do this, oh, I need a partial library in Python, let me go on GitHub. And then you look at code that someone else has written and you look at it, you're like, yeah, this is so hard to read. It's probably easier if I just write my own partial framework, which... I think very often it's not really true, but we think it's true because we have practiced writing so much. That's where our fluency is, but we've never really practiced reading. We don't really have theories for reading. So of course it is hard. If I ask non-trained people to do a marathon tomorrow, they'd be like, that is super hard because I never did a marathon. But a marathon isn't inherently hard, right? I know if you've never ran a marathon, this probably sounds like terrible to you, but it isn't inherently hard. I mean, you can already walk. It's just you do that many, many times. It's only hard if you've never practiced. If you, if you practice a lot, doing a marathon is, is not so bad, actually. And it's sort of the same with code, where with reading code, where it sounds terrible, but that's because you never practice. But you could practice, you can actually get a lot better at code reading if you would just practice. So here's a few things that you can do. What I hope that you do after watching this video, the next time that you actually encounter code that is hard to read, I hope that you will reflect and you will think, okay, so that was uncomfortable. Is this a long-term memory issue? Is it just really hard because I don't know syntax? Is this a short-term memory issue? Is this just really hard because I have to remember many things and I don't yet know what is and what isn't important? Or is this a working memory issue where you're like, okay, I think I can oversee all the syntax elements and all the elements that play a role, but I don't know how they interact with each other. These three different problems have different solutions. So if your problem is, I don't know the syntax, then you can learn, you could practice syntax. I know it's not really a thing we do, but it works just really, really well. So you can make a stack of cards called flashcards, where on one hand side, you put the, the prompt, so you, for example, in the APL example, you could put on one side the T, which actually isn't a T, it's called encode. And then on the other side of the card, you say encode. And this is how you could learn all the APL keywords that are all operators. But of course, this doesn't have to be APL. It can also be Python, where you say for loop on one hand side, and then the syntax of the for loop on the other side. Or if there's a certain, um, an, a certain API that you want to learn, retrieve a file and then what, what you have to do is on the other side of the card. If you practice that, you'll get a bigger vocabulary of syntax. So then you're less likely to have these long-term memory issues. If you have working memory issues, on the other hand, if it's very, very hard to process the individual elements of code and how they interact with each other, you can support your working memory. Your working memory is basically, it's your short-term memory applied to a certain problem. So it also has this very small size limitation, but you could help it. For example, something you could do is you could have a tracing table like you see here, where you step-by-step step analyze what's going on. So you say, okay, in the initialization, 
and the seven and two is seven very systematically uh, b string is the empty string and n1 is also seven and then step by step okay look iteration one this is what happens iteration two this is what happens and you can do this manually as you see me do here but clearly of course this can also be done supported by an ide where you really systematically step through the code to try to gain an understanding and make it easier for your working memory to understand because you offload the important information somewhere and this could be on a literal piece of paper or you can put all of this as watches on variables in your IDE but at least you're offloading some of your working memory elsewhere so that you could process code more easily. So that is the good news. You can get better at reading code. Firstly, by self-reflecting and understanding what type of confusion are we dealing with? What you can also do as a really, really nice technique to remember code is, sorry, to diagnose code reading skills is to remember code. So if I show this code to you for a little bit, just well, maybe not half a second as I did with the sentences, but three minutes, for example. And then I take the code away. And now I would ask you, reproduce that code as best as you can. If you do that, you will get a really nice insight into what you know. Because some of these parts, like the highlighted parts here, come from your long-term memory. Probably public class, public static void main. You didn't really remember that. You just remembered define a class and define a main method. And then later on, you use your long-term memory to reproduce the exact syntax because you already know it. Whereas some things in this program, the highlighted here in green, come from your short-term memory. Remembering that this was in search and sort, remembering that this variable was called array and the values in it were 45 and 12, etc. That is all coming from your short-term memory and then it comes together. And actually at this time, a little uh, marketing for my research, we are exploring this. So if you're just interested in helping science figure it out, you can go to felina.com slash test where we have a little memory exercise in Java for you.